Hello and welcome to 11FS Spotlight. I'm Simon Taylor. In this show, we shine a spotlight on the best and brightest in tech and financial services to understand what gets them going, what gets them growing, and what they think the future of the industry might just look like. On today's Spotlight, I'm joined by Alex Durrett, who is Product Director of Wealth Management over at Terminus. Alex, great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Hi, Simon. Very good. Thank you. And, and thanks for having me today. Uh, on today's show, we are going to talk a little bit about you and your career, but also the wealth management space. And I'm excited to jump into that with you because it's often misunderstood. Oh, these poor rich people with all their money, but actually it's incredibly challenging, difficult and an interesting subject area. And I think we can all learn something from it, no matter no matter where we are in, in our lives. So um, tell us a little bit about what you do at Terminos to get us started, Alex. So I am the product director for wealth management at Temenos. Uh, we, we do a lot more than that within Temenos. We cover all types of banks, retail banking, corporate banking, etc. But wealth is a very key strategic area for Temenos. So as the, the product director, I'm overseeing the, the strategy of the, the company, of the, the roadmap of the product in that area. So wealth management, private banking and everything around it. I mean, that's a pretty big old, big old scope. So tell us a little bit about uh, Temenos. Uh, what were you doing before that in your career history and what made you want to join? I haven't done much before that, to be honest, because I've been with Temenos for more than 20 years now. Um, so um, when I, before joining Temenos, I was working in the, in the bank. Um, yeah, same bank, going, going there every morning, leaving every evening, same bank in Paris. Um, and then I heard about this small company at the time. It was a small company, even a startup, um, that was offering some potential to go and travel and see the world. You know, I was, uh, something like 20 years old and, uh, I wanted to see the world and the, the current job I was, I was doing was not really what I had expected before. So I joined Temenos as employee number 413. And we're now more than 7,000, I think. So the company has changed quite a lot since then. And, uh, I've been there the whole time. So how did you get into the wealth management space? And um, and, and what's, what's that look like for you at Temos? The initially I started in working in the, the core banking space, which is really the, the, the Temenos' core expertise. But I've always liked uh, the, the, the challenge of complexity. And if you look at wealth management, private banking, you surely get a lot of that because this is an area where you need a bit of everything. A private bank needs to do everything. So uh, it needs to, in some respect, to behave like a retail bank. It needs the same kind of, um, of products and expertise. And of course, everything above that, all the... Uh, um, the complexity around securities trading, all these different types of instruments, derivatives, structured products, all these things that you don't see anywhere else. So that that's kind of complexity really uh, appealed to me at the time. And um, I'm glad I'm, um, that's what I'm still doing today. And I want to unpack that complexity because it, it, it's often misunderstood. Maybe it's like starting with the customer and their lives and their complexity uh, sort of talk me through how you segment a wealth customer um, and what the different flavors of customer look like in, in wealth management for you. And then talk about some of maybe the challenges they have. And then maybe that gives us a good frame to start thinking about, well, what are some of the solutions and some of the opportunities? Well, it's very, it's a, the very typical segmentation of clients, it's, it's the, the high net worth individuals. They usually um, categorized by the the uh, the assets, the assets and the management that they bring to the bank. So you, you we start at the very top with the ultra high net worth individuals, and then the high net worth individuals, and then there's different names or, or, or brands for these clients that can be premium clients, um, uh, mass affluent. And then you end up with retail, which uh, which I would still include in the, in the in the entire scope because some of these clients can be served through automated means like robo advisor and so on. So wealth management really does apply no matter how much 
your salary is, there is a wealth management product for you because ultimately, if you're trying to retire, if you're trying to invest in stocks, if you're trying to grow whatever savings you have, at some level, you are connected to financial markets and you could be on that journey towards complexity. And who knows, maybe one day you make it into high net worth or ultra high net worth. So uh, that opportunity is always there. So how do you think about some of the, the products Temnos has um, and talk me through sort of, you mentioned some of those complexities. Build me up from sort of the standard retail banking products to the to some of the ones that sit alongside that. Uh, yes, we we um, we offer an, a number of different products actually to, to serve to serve our clients. Um, so in terms of yeah, growing complexity, if you like, you would start with your traditional um, um, investment account with the, the most traditional products. So usually, when you when you enter a a, um, a wealth management or not not a wealth management firm, but let's say a retail bank, you will be offered with a typical products which is an allocation in funds. Um, in the private banking space and wealth management space, the offering is a lot larger than that. And that's what we help cover with our with our portfolio management system. So it's uh, it's equities, it's fixed income, it's derivatives, it's, as I mentioned, it's structured products. And you try to uh, propose the, the best allocation to the client depending on their risk appetite, depending on their experience and knowledge of the market, whether they expect the bank to manage it all for them, which is often the case, you know, the types of clients that are, for instance, entrepreneurs, successful mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, I don't have time to manage my own money, so I'm going to delegate all of that to, uh, to a bank for me. So that's uh, um, a discretionary mandate. Uh, you could have an advisory mandate where you expect the bank to, um, to actually guide you, but you make the final decision and it's actually a discussion with your advisor. Um, and sometimes an execution only. I know I know what I want to do. I ju I'm just using the bank as the, the recipient for my assets. And and often, actually, it's a combination of all these things. So mm -hmm. you can have multiple portfolios and decide what you're going to do with it. So let's give a, a strong one argument. You've got an entrepreneur who has done well at, uh, at, at a startup. They've, they have five to 10 million in assets, maybe 20, 30 million in assets, somewhere along those lines, they're getting some complexity, maybe they have a, a house now. And there's some sectors they understand really well because they built a technology company. So maybe in that sector, they want execution only because they know what they want to buy, they know what they want to sell. But in emerging markets, do they know it? In art, should they have an allocation towards alternative assets as well? So how much of that do you see um, sort of evolving towards this concept of personalization or hyper-personalization? And how can um, private banks and brands start to start to do that and get closer to their customers' needs? So it's a very good point. It's actually um, a hot topic at the moment in the industry. How do we um, how can bank differentiate, attract new clients, but also retain existing clients by offering something that's that's even more personalized? So it's a high touch industry, as we say. So there's always this component of a strong interaction with the, the relationship manager, the advisor, the portfolio manager. But nowadays, we're all getting used to getting that kind of hyper personalization. If you're using Google, if you're using one of the, the, the big techs, you get that type of also of, of service automatically through through machines, and so um, in addition to the, the the personal relationship, what we're trying to do, what banks are trying to do, and we're trying to help them, is to um, offer also this kind of hyper personalization to augment, if you like, the the relationship manager with, with tools mm -hmm. where they can better serve their clients and that's where i need to drop in the the, the word of ai artificial intelligence um it's it's been um, a trend in the market for the for the last few years and it's here to stay uh, most banks are sitting on a gold mine of data uh, which is not really well exploited nowadays because you need the technology and the skills to do that and um, a key example is you you know you what the client has done in the past, where the choices were in the past. You know what other clients with the same kind of profile are doing and, and whether they've been successful at it or not. So based on all this data, you can put in place some algorithms to to 
crunch the data and basically come up with the best recommendation for this particular client in this particular context. And that's that's really hyper personalization. So an example, yes, it's um, offering the next best advice to the client based on the, really the current context and who they are. It could be their gender, um, it could be their age, it could be the types of investment they have already, it could be their tastes, mm-hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. As, as an individual, you might be able to do that, but we are really trying to to guide the bank and help the bank with automated models that behind the scenes are going to uh, to provide this this additional type of service. I, I really love that because it's it's moving away from digital being an advisor with an iPad to actually an advisor who's able to suggest and recommend products that are really really relevant to to that customer in a way that that might not be and i think so long digital was about the interface and the worry was well isn't this removing the role of the advisor whereas actually you're making them much smarter and you're deepening the relationship there by by sort of using the technology in, in the background but are there other ways to augment the advisory role, the human element of it that you're starting to see with with the products? I know um, the role of the advisor has always been described to me as so important when everybody has that number. You know, I'm happy to do execution only up to a certain amount, but once it's a material percentage of my net worth, I want somebody else to tell me it's okay. So that that role probably probably still functions. But what are you seeing that's innovation in the advisory sort of um, plus technology space? There, there's also about well, yeah. The other major trend is is what we the buzzword is hybrid advisory. Mm-hmm. So there is a a, well, we haven't mentioned digitization, which is something that that's really taken the, the world by storm, especially because of COVID, the world of financial services. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe more than five years ago, you would go to a to a bank, a private bank, and, and talk about the cool app. You have the cool mobile app, and nobody would hear about it because look look at my average client is is probably over 60 year old or 70 we're not interested in that you know what really matters is the the direct interactions the meetings with the clients um some banks didn't have that that uh, state of mind and were already thinking of digitization but covid has has really put everything on an equal footing it's it's a must you need to have uh, digital channels self service channels so i think everybody's getting there in uh, more or less success but that's changed something. It means that now clients are, are more aware to the fact that they can do actually a lot themselves mm. um, through those channels, just through the app. Why, why should it be different? I can do so many things with my phone today. Why not banking? Why not looking at my my wealth? Why not managing my wealth? So the, the whole concept of hybrid advisory is mixing the best of both worlds, um, which is also a relief, I, I might say, for, for the bank because they can also delegate some of the, the less interesting tasks to the clients themselves, exactly like in, in the retail banking space. I, but I also think it's sort of when does somebody want hands on the wheel money and when does somebody want self-driving money? And that might be different by the client. So having the ability to balance those and personalize where where that boundary is 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 a really difficult challenge i think in in that hybrid space when's the human more powerful when's the the technology more powerful but if the technology can do a, a lot of it then you, how that gets revealed can then be be personalized and that that's exciting so i'm interested in what you see as the biggest challenges for anybody in the wealth management space anybody trying to deliver products what are what are the, your clients struggling with um, as um, th- there is fierce competition in that space, but that is it different to uh, any- anywhere else? I'm not sure. There is a lot of regulation, um, and that keeps increasing. Um, especially here, we're talking. We're both of us in in Europe, so there's there's a lot of regulations coming from from this part of the world, but the same in the US. Um, and also in, in Asia. So the, all banks need to um, need to be ready to adapt very quickly to uh, stringent rules that keep coming up. And the, the imagination of regulators is uh, has no limit there. Um, there's the these investments. Again, it's it's a high touch business. So there's there's 
super high costs for the banks compared to the, the more retail banks who can basically automate everything. You, you see all the branches closing around the world, around, uh, but in, in wealth, it, it will remain different. You need that, you need that personal relationship with, uh, with your relationship manager. So the, the cost base is quite different. And that's, that's also a, a struggle. So if you have a certain size, very large bank, that's fine for, for the smaller ones. Um, they, they will always struggle to uh, to maintain their their margins um, to to keep the costs under control while still acquiring new clients and growing the assets under management. It's a never ending. It, it was possible to be quite a small boutique advisory uh, wealth management business, and when the world wasn't fully digital, you could manage that at quite a low cost infrastructure. It was a good business. When the customer expectation is digital. Can you afford now to have the same technology as some of the biggest customer banks in the world? Probably not, but you could certainly do so in your own way and in a unique way uh, by working with partners. So maybe it's not as much self-build and it's it, it's a different approach and a different go-to-market. So I think that's that's hugely exciting of, of what could be possible with these more nimble, smaller, agile players that have a loyal but small but size, but important customer base and, and what they can do. do. Do you think the wealth management space needs disruption? Are you seeing anything coming along those lines um, and, and as you look across the, as, as you look across the globe? That, that's where we come in. Um, that's where you, you mentioned the, the, the smaller um, firms. That's where we can help to, to become more digital um, to. To, to get basically the same the same tools the same weapons that the much larger banks have is it's uh, that that software um, players like Temenos deliver is the same software that they keep that equips the larger banks um, and th there's um, the same technology just at, at a, a smaller scale and probably a lower cost um, it's it's super important. Another keyword at the moment, key trend is the cloud and uh, and SaaS services. Uh, again, five years ago, it was a big no, no, don't don't even try to to enter that kind of discussion. And now it's it's all changed. It's 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 probably for some banks, it's probably more secure to put their, their software in the cloud, really, because those big players, the Amazons, Googles, uh, Microsofts of this world will invest a lot more than than the bank themselves could ever, ever spend. So in, your, in, in fact, it's actually more secure to get there. Um, the And then the, the, the savings, as I mentioned before, you're trying to, to work on your margins to reduce the costs. And moving to the cloud is a great way of doing that, you know, because uh, then then you're competing on the same levels as the, the much larger players and, and also as the, the retail banks. It's interesting how sort of fixed infrastructure has moved to real time infrastructure. If I had to run a data center, I had to staff it. I also had to then compete with the best in the world from the security standpoint. It's one thing to lose a picture of somebody's cat. It's another thing to lose somebody's entire net worth. So you can see why banks get very, very concerned about security as, as they absolutely should. But the best in the world are doing this for the best in the world. Why wouldn't you use those if it materially alters your, your cost structure? That makes complete sense. And some of the innovation you see around sort of the security you can offer and the privacy you can offer a wealth management customer with modern technology and, and cryptography that is baked into a lot of these cloud solutions and baked into providers like Temenos is, is hugely exciting. So how do you think uh, the the uh, market evolves over the next two to three to five years even? What are we going to start to, to see as you look out? Uh, are we going to see private banking for the mass market um, and mass affluent take off again as interest rates rise? Are we going to see real disruption in new providers appearing perhaps in the um, in the mid market or the high net worth space? There's been some some waves in the past. Uh, at some point, maybe two, three years ago, it was all about robo advisors and, and the rise of fintechs that that died down a little bit. Um, I think yeah, the, the next the next battle you mentioned mass affluence. Um, that's it remains a key market which is um, not 
well, a bit underserved, both by by it's it sits between retail and and uh, wealth management, and so clients with uh, between uh, hundred thousand and a million in in assets to invest, um, they usually don't get the service that they would deserve from retail banks, and they're kind of too small for wealth. Um, that's where again technology can help because when you can automate so many things through. Uh, through proper software, um, then you're suddenly able to address this type of customer segments. So th there's a, a drive from private banks to try and tap into this market to better serve these clients. Because once you have all the, again, once you have all the, the platforms in place, the tooling in place, it's in the cloud, it's cheaper to run, then suddenly you can start and open it up to a different breed of clients. Um, Likewise, retail banks would probably be interested in that kind of population because nowadays, because of market conditions, um, it's a bit difficult to be investing in, the, in, in that space. The, uh, there's a war, the interest rates are still low. Um, so one way to, to make more money and is to look at clients who do have money. So um, I think it, it will converge from both sides. I think that's super interesting. You've got the retail banks moving up, the wealth banks moving down, and you were talking about how hyper-competitive the space is. Everybody's sort of running after that middle middle ground customer uh, and, and looking at their own their own way in and looking for the platform that enables them to, to kind of serve that, which, as you say, could only squeeze the margins that are there. So how are you going to stand out? How are you going to make this customer the one that works with you? Is it just going to be having a great interest rate or is it going to be something about your service level that really makes you stand out in, in that digital world so that's that that that's exciting to me uh, and so you stand back and look at this i mean you've been in this industry for a while and you've been working in uh, wealth management for a while what's the misconception that you always come up against what do what do you find yourself explaining to people time and time again whether it's about the private banks themselves or the customers or or anything um yeah, maybe about the the clients themselves. Um, it's oftentimes I think it's uh, well, you, you have the whole tri net worth, which which form a breed of, of, of their own, but many times the, the the clients of those banks are people who get an inheritance. Um, they just many of them are just people like you and I, you know, and um, and trying to serve this. I think I think. Also, one of the misconceptions is they're disconnected from the rest of the world, and that that might have been the case. But there's another trend which which I think is going to reconnect everybody is ESG investing. Um, so ethical social governance or sustainable investments. And suddenly, because because of these new rules coming into play, um, there, there's a chance for for wealthy investors to. Um, to align their values with where they're putting their money. I think it's it's a great message. So suddenly, instead of just blindly uh, putting money in uh, equities, funds, etc., you say, no, I want I want to put my money where it makes a difference. If I'm interested in, uh, in, uh, in the environment, I want to make sure that I invest in companies that are committed to reducing their CO2 footprint, or I want to invest my money into companies that promote gender diversity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So suddenly, um, the wealthy, I think, have have a role to play and the responsibility in in putting their values um, in the money, or vice versa. I saw a great statistic once that suggested that um, sixty percent of all money in financial markets is controlled by uh, is owned by ultimately a, a retail individual or a human being rather than an institution. I think it was the Investment Management Association or or somebody on IAM or somebody along those lines. And uh, if if that is indeed true, then the wealthy would make up the vast majority of that uh, because of the power law. And of course, the impact that they can have with that is astonishing if if the greatest concentration of wealth on earth concentrates where it's, it's putting its investment into causes that could be transformational then that could be hugely exciting so how do we enable them to do that it's always uh, if you change where the money moves you change the outcome for society and the role these people can play i think could be massively outsized and often often um often misunderstood so 
as we sort of round out on this, um, what are your what are your takeaways as you speak to clients at the moment? What are the um, sort of advice that you're giving them in order to get their house in order? Um, if they're struggling with either the transition to cloud or AI, what are the get the basics right things that you say every every client um, trying to get after the wealth management space should be should be thinking about and doing? Well, usually my advice would be look look at our software. <laughs> we have. Um, we, everything we've been talking about since the beginning, this is the kind of um, um, service we offer and that's what we've been doing for for many years now. Um, the technology is there. A, a, a bank is not supposed anymore to be a software factory as, as has been the case for, for a long time. Um, they should be focusing on their clients and leave yeah, leave the technology, leave the software to the specialists so that they can really focus on what's what's important to their clients, what's important to to their uh, investors as well, their staff, and the technology we can deal with. Indeed. Well, as we come towards the end of the show, um, we always like to finish off by asking you um, a question uh, that you can answer however you like. You can sort of pick, pick whichever way you want to go. So what advice would you give to your younger self today? I think I wouldn't change a thing. I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, with uh, the choices I've made, with joining Tamanos, with the... Uh, with, uh, seeing the the company grow with being in that space of financial services i mean when it's very it's very difficult when you're when you're talking to friends and family etc to explain what you're doing you know well, banking financial wealth management really but uh no really it's a very exciting space there's a there's still so much to do um in that space so much to to create to invent to transform so I, my younger self, I would just tell him to do exactly the same, I think. That's awesome. But what about um, folks coming into the industry that want to learn wealth management? What's your advice to young professionals who think, okay, this is a complex industry. The challenges here are exciting. What, what advice would you give them? Uh, depends where... Where, well, depends where they work. I think uh, they, they need to be technology savvy. That's that will be a probably a key difference to uh, to their their peers that have been working in that area for the last twenty years. They need to understand a lot more about the technology, the the mobile apps. Again, mentioned artificial intelligence. You don't need to be a pro, but you need to to understand all these concepts because you might be facing clients who do. So you need to be uh, at least at, at their level. There's there's a lot of training also to be done. There's all these regulations coming in uh, all the time. Uh, there is ESG, as we mentioned, there's digital assets, um, uh, Bitcoin, etc. So there's a, a lot to learn in order to be really effective and efficient and credible. I think that always be learning mindset is, is super useful. Uh, and just before we finish, what's next for you and for Temenos? What can we look forward to? Um, I mentioned some of the few keywords. So in ESG investing is definitely something we're, we're investing in. Um, it's super important. Digital assets, so um, cryptocurrencies to begin with, and in future, maybe other things like tokenized securities, um, NFTs. Um, these are really changing the, uh, the, the, the market. We're also uh, um, improving our SaaS services, bringing more and more to the cloud all the time so that in the end, a bank can run entirely um, on the cloud. So these are the, the things we're focusing on for, for this year and the next couple of years. Indeed, there are lots of very crypto rich folks out there with very high quality problems, um, but very high assets under management that need help. So uh, why wouldn't you go address that market? Com completely makes sense to me. Uh, already, well, that does bring us towards the end of the show. Um, Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Where can people find out more about you and more about Temenos? Um, on the website, which we're actually uh, going to rebrand very briefly, uh, very soon um, on, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, directly by email, especially if you have a specific request, prospects, ideas, we're, we're always, we're coming uh, 
welcoming people with, with ideas. Fantastic. That's all we have for this week. Uh, thank you for watching, if you've been watching along. And uh, make sure you follow 11FS on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, TikTok to stay updated with all of the stuff we're doing. My goodness, there's a lot. Um, and if you do enjoy the show, why not subscribe to the YouTube channel? Click it um, and give us a like as well. Share it, share it with everybody. Just share the love. And uh, if you want to catch up on previous episodes, do check out the channel. Thank you, everybody, and have a great week.